for 20 years I was a cattle rancher in Wyoming. And if somebody had told me that I was going to find myself at this stage of my life doing this, I would have found that a little improbable. But, you know, at that stage of my life, the idea that there could even be this would have been more than a little improbable. Now, I don't know, it's a fairly large group of people, and I have a hard time seeing faces when the, the lights are this bright on mine, but to the extent possible, at some point I want to have something in the way of a, a conversation with you, even recognizing that it will be very asymmetrical, uh, though probably not as symmetrical as the conversation between Comcast and the American people. <laughs> <laughs> But bad anyway. Uh, I am trying to, to eliminate broadcast media and I don't want to become one. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk about a few major principles uh, and things that I think are very interesting about the phenomena that you represent uh, and give you a little insight into, you know, I, I have to confess I am now an elder of the internet. I'm an, el I'm an internet uncle. And for, for somebody who spent most of his time uh, in his life refusing to ever not be an adolescent, the idea of being an elder is, is something of a drag, but it, it, it turns out to be useful if you can be a, an adolescent and an elder at the same time. <laughs> you know, you've got the same desire to do crazy shit, but you, you know which crazy shit is likely to fail badly. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they, that looks like fun, but let me tell you, <laughs> I remember, uh, no, I, uh, when I first came around the thing that, that I believe I'm, you know, it was Bill Gibson's word, but I'm the guy that started using it for what it, what it is, when I first came around cyberspace, uh, in 1985, uh, it was very interesting to me that there was already an identifiable culture in this space that was not yet a space. There was a, there was, um, a flavor that it had. And it was just on the strength of that faint whiff of culture that I got the idea that there might one day be a, a new substrate for community to form in. Because I came from a small town in Wyoming and I could see that the, the community that was based on places like my small town in Wyoming where family agriculture was at the root of the economics and, and there was a sense of shared adversity and real density in your relationship with your neighbors and, and, and necessity. Uh, I could see that all those things were being supplanted by television land and, and suburbia and a large corporate working environment where it was, it was considered to be good form to make yourself out to be just like everybody else so that the corporation would think that you were a good interchangeable machine part. Uh, and the primary impetus for privacy was so that the, the company that you wanted to work for wouldn't be able to tell that you, like every other one of the masks that God wears, was weird as hell. Uh, and everybody is, by the way. I mean, I, <laughs> I used to marvel at, you know, these very ordinary people who would talk about how, how crazy their friends were. You know, the friends are crazy. <laughs> Uh, because, because if you get down to an actual examination of people on the inside, uh, they're, they're unusual. And I mean, I, I'm, I'm one of those people who really insists on talking to you on the airplane. <laughs> you hate those, huh, some of you, I know. <laughs> but I do it anyway. And <laughs> mostly to prove to you that you're more interesting than you think you are. Uh, which I almost always can. But I was worried about, I was worried about all those kinds of, of crushing uh, aspects that, we, that, that we, I could see my country falling into, or my, my culture, or the world for that matter, with the generification of everything. And I became uh, truly convinced that 
that the answer to this was to spread the internet everywhere and to have the culture of, of that set of, of really almost, I have to say, divinely given intellects uh, and, and hearts that had been the original uncles of the internet, have that become something that grew embedded in, in the culture of cyberspace from their very small point until it included everybody, which it inevitably would. And now we see everything as well. Uh, and it, it, I actually, it, it, at first I thought it was going to be a slam dunk, but I mean, I, I thought that, you know, the age of Aquarius was going to be a slam dunk at a certain point too. <laughs> so <laughs> I was already prepared for disappointment. Uh, but I really felt that there was something that was so naturally liberating about the internet and that it was about connection. It wasn't about separation, which broadcast media obviously were. It was about the conversation. It wasn't about the, it wasn't about the channel. It wasn't about content, which the word only recently derived when the containers went away. Uh, note that, it's a code word for we're a large corporation and we own all human expression. We call it content. Um, it was, it had, the, it had the potential, which I still think it has, of giving a voice to everybody, in spite of the fact that that, in many cases, will be a terrible idea. <laughs> uh, but let, you know, I, I also have faith in the ability of people to, to create a system where they, just because everybody, everybody has a voice doesn't mean that everybody has to listen to it. You know, so uh, the dis discriminating digestive systems, I think, I thought then, and I still think, would evolve. And I was pretty, I was pretty gung ho on this internet, and I and I thought that we were just going to actually slide in invisibly into the gap that would be that would be vacated by the nation states as they realized that they had nothing left to do. Uh, after, the, after the Cold War, and we'd gone to a global economy. And uh, I, I underestimated them. And I, I underestimated the three monotheistic world religions who, who naturally, and I think correctly, regarded the internet as the ultimate heresy. Because the internet is about authority gathered by consensus over a large horizontal plane where authority is not only not God-given, it is, it is earned by a lot of other people having exposed a set of phenomena to their own perceptions and judged them to be of the same view as to what those, those phenomena may represent. And they need not be filtered through uh, a, a book or a document or something that is absolutely positively right. This really plays hell with God-given authority, which has been the system that we've been operating under for quite a, while, quite a while. And when I say under, I do mean under. You know, the great white column with God on top and you on the bottom, and mostly, you know, male figures in the middle, and, um, and, and three books that you had to adhere to. And as, as things started to come apart for those for those things, they became much more fierce in their, in their demand that, that their constituents observe them religiously, shall we say. Uh, and, and moreover, I knew that the record business was, was the ugliest thing I'd ever seen, but somehow I didn't think that it was quite as ugly as it turned out to be. I mean, it, what, what it turned out to be was something that was so ugly that it would rather kill itself and everybody in it than do something that was wise and decent. Uh, and that's pretty much what it's done. And I've spent many years trying to explain to them that, that it is actually not in their best interest to make expression scarce. There's a huge difference between an information economy and, and, uh, 
and a, an economy of, of hard goods in the sense that Adam Smith was perfectly right about, uh, about scarcity and value, right? It's completely different with expression and information where familiarity has value, scarcity, not so much. I mean, if I've got the world's largest diamond in my pocket, uh, outside of making a, a big lump that people might be curious about, nobody will know that it's there, and, uh, or maybe not curious about it. Uh, <laughs> nobody will know that it's there, and, uh, and it will still be incredibly valuable. If I have the world's greatest song in my head, it is useless, valueless, has no value until I've started sharing it with people. And then it gathers value fairly slowly on the basis of how many people can sing along. That's a very different thing. And the band that I wrote for discovered this accidentally. I mean, we, we invented viral marketing without really meaning to, uh, like most of the things we did actually, <laughs> very, <laughs> very improvisational organization, <laughs> as <laughs> LSD will do that to it. Uh, doesn't give you a lot of choice. Uh, and we noticed that, that people were, were taping our concerts and, and in, the, in the early days, and you know, the record people, the folks at Warner Brothers said that we had to stop them because they were stealing something from us, and we, and we kind of went along with that for a while, and, and then we all said, well, wh wh what are they stealing? I mean, it's not like we ever play the same show twice. So, is it that people won't buy the records if they're these tapes? That doesn't seem right. And besides, it's just not good for you to be mean to a deadhead, especially if you're the Grateful Dead, because deadheads, are, <laughs> they're a hapless bunch. <laughs> you know, it's just, <laughs> well. I couldn't do it, and neither could they. So we let people tape our concerts, not realizing that what was going to happen was that those tapes were going to become this unbelievably effective system for spreading the word about what we did. Uh, and by the time we actually did die, you know, actually, there's, I don't know whether we've died yet, we still seem to you know, cling to weird life, but. Uh, I would say that we were, we were done when Jerry Garcia was back in 95, but at that point we could fill any stadium in, in America and maybe the world uh, without ever having had a hit record based on the fact that all of our tapes had been big hits uh, and the fact that we could haul our audience around with us, <laughs> which, you know, it's good if you can do that. Uh, but this brings me around to you folks in a way, because part of the reason we can haul our audience around with us, and part of the reason why that sharing uh, and sense of com community was so critical among the deadheads, is what intrigues me about you Pythonistas. Uh, because, now there have been cultures associated with languages before, I mean, I. Yeah, French is a good example. <laughs> I, I rode here yesterday, God bless him. I, I, I don't know if he's in the audience, but uh, uh, Tarek, Tarek Zaide. I don't know, if, I think I, I slaughtered your name, Tarek, but uh, uh, who is French and uh, he was on both of the hideous flights that I was on. We took great comfort in one another. And I was talking about the French Academy and French language and, and Python and, and how culture uh, and the language itself had a, this mutually defining quality and where authority lay in that system. Since one of the things that occurred to me when I, when I first encountered the internet, I, I, I turned to my friend Mitch Kapoor with whom I started the Electronic Frontier Foundation, I said, at last, it's a working anarchy. <laughs> and he said, well, probably, but it's been my observation that inside every working anarchy, there's an old boy network. And, you know, in this case, I think we may have a, a young girl network that's coming along, too. Thank you. Uh, 
And I, that's not lip service. I mean, that, part of the reason I'm here is because that, that is actually the, you know, a very interesting thing about you pythons. You, you know, there are a lot of you that, despite the big phallic symbol for the, for the, just <laughs> went and did it anyway. Uh, um, but, but he also alluded to the fact that there was usually a benevolent dictator somewhere in there. And I believe you have one. I, I hope he's here, <laughs> being benevolent. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and, and this, you know, back in the beginning of, uh, of computer languages, there actually were a few things that had a culture that you could see was associated with the language. Uh, usually they were very small and intense and, and often cult-like. You know, tech, T-E-X. Uh, people, people would get kind of crazy about that. <laughs> there were lisp people that would go a little nuts on you. Uh, and, you know, and then there was the culture around C and, and Unix generally the Unix weenie culture where everybody looked like Dennis Ritchie. But, you know, in those days, practically everybody who had anything to do with computers looked like Dennis Ritchie anyway. <laughs> but this is very different. I mean, uh, Python is, you know, Python is young and stylish and, you know, actually far more engaged with... Uh, with the party of the, of the whole than the Unix weenies ever dreamed of being. You know, I, I went to a lot of their, their gatherings and they thought they were being pretty social if they were looking at your shoes. Uh, and, and, and this has a completely different flavor. And, that, and that's really important because because since, since I was wrong about how the governments of the industrial world were gonna just sort of fold up their hand and split, and since they've come back with a gigantic vengeance and are, are absolutely convinced that it is their right and duty to impose all the stuff they had that didn't work in the physical world onto cyberspace, give it another really nasty shot, especially aimed with the ability to surveil everybody on the planet in a way that they never could have had before. So, you know, I take a great deal of comfort in the fact that I have almost daily conversations with Ed Snowden that they can't stop. <laughs> if they were all that good, they could, they could make it so that we couldn't talk, I would think. Or maybe they just want to listen in because it's more amusing than what they're thinking about, but... Uh, no, I mean, they, they came back, and they came back strong, and, and, the, and the problem is that as things get taken over by things like, like Comcast, which ha certainly has no Bill of Rights, and as things get taken over uh, by these new sort of meta uh, bodies of, of international forum, like the ITT, dreadful, artifact of, of horror, um, you have not regulatory redress. What you have is cultural redress. What you have is, is something that is much harder to wrap opposition around. But you know a lot of things without having to say them. You folks have a lot of unwritten codes that are incredibly powerful in an environment like this and you are spreading the culture of openness and collaboration and curiosity and human service into the environment that will become the foundations for the future. I mean, I dream of a day, and it's, it's not a crazy dream, when everybody on this planet who wants to know all that is presently known about something will be able to do so regardless of where he or she is. And, and I dream of a day where the right to know 
is understood to be a natural human right that extends to every being on the planet who is governed by anything the right to know what its government is doing and how and why. And I rely almost entirely on people like you who are building the plumbing uh, and who are def really defining the politics. I mean, one, one of the things in the beginning of EFF, uh, I, I was expressing dismay that it just suddenly dawned on me that, that first of all, that the, the Bill of Rights, the United States Bill of Rights was a set of local ordinances that actually only applied within the confines of, of places where that government that had supposedly advanced those, those notions could enforce them by having at the same time the ability to take them away and that if you were moving into an environment where they didn't have that ability necessarily, you were also moving into an environment where they didn't have the ability to extend them either. That rights were not something that you could count on any government or body to extend. That rights had to be part of the technical architecture of the internet. And you are the people, and people like you, that, that you will attract into your numbers. You are the people that will define that technical architecture and will make sure that that dream that I think you share as well will come to us and that we will end up being extremely good ancestors after all. Thank you. Yeah, we, when you're from music, you like to be able to do an encore. Now, uh, <laughs> now I would like to do some Q and A. Uh, if we got, I think we got a little time, right? Who's the guy with the cards? We got some time. Time is up. Time is up. Plenty. Oh, oh, well, plenty of time. Excellent. Okay, great. Now, I can't see. So what I'm going to actually at, depend upon is that the guys with the mics will will take them to somebody that they think might have something interesting to say. <laughs> Thank you very much for your talk. Um, you talked a, a bit about rights. I was just curious, how do you define a right? Well, I, I define a right as, as uh, the generally recognized ability of somebody to do something uh, that some may wish they didn't do, but that they are allowed to do because it is their right. I mean, uh, you know, when I think of the right of free speech, what I think of is that, you know, there is some son of a bitch that I disagree with categorically who has the most odious, toxic stuff that he says. And by God, I, I, I am going to defend that motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I think about it. He has a right to be that person, as long as he doesn't get so toxic that he insists that I, I share his views. Uh, and that, a, right, a right is like that, a right, uh, a right is, is the ability to manifest yourself against the powerful in a way that is generally accorded uh, a kind of sovereignty by, by those within your culture. Hey, thanks. Thanks for your talk. Um, I, I just had a, a couple of uh, 
related questions. One in the future where they need, any, by the way, they needn't be questions. You can you can come at me if you want. <laughs> uh, no, uh, definitely questions. Um, one just sort of dealt with, in, in this current era, we're shipping all of our data to clouds that are controlled by a few large, big corporations. And it, in this future, is, is privacy um, part of our life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness if information is so freely available that we can sort of quickly look up anything about anything? And as the cloud um, storage and compute costs sort of it's sort of a race to the bottom, seemingly, between uh, the big providers. Um, the, the long pole in the tent has been connectivity, and now we see uh, initiatives like internet.org emerging uh, with Facebook trying to bring connectivity to places of the world it could have probably never been before. Um, sort of curious how you think that may play out as the, the future unfolds. Well, there's, a, there's a lot to unbundle in that. Uh, but like I say, I came from a small town. Well, one of the things about coming from a small town is that nobody has any privacy in a small town. I mean, everybody's really famous in a small town. <laughs> and, uh, and so I grew up without, without that sense that, you know, other people didn't know everything that I was up to. But the thing was that we had mutually assured destructive capacity. If somebody wanted, <laughs> you know, I knew where their bodies were buried too, damn it. And, uh, <laughs> It was best just not to start digging on either side. Uh, the problem that I have at the moment is that, yes, I, I think privacy is doomed. And I actually think that privacy is actually a little kind of pathological. Uh, I mean, the, the, the reasons that we want privacy are not good reasons. The reasons we want privacy are because we fear the judgment of, of, of organizations that should not be exercising judgment over those matters. It. As long as as long as we as long as we do our jobs and do them well, I don't. You know, if we go home and, and also do three pigs and a cat, that's our that's our deal. Uh, and so, but the problem is that we don't know what judgments those large institutions are making. There's this utter asymmetry that is getting worse between the, the loss of privacy on the part of the individual and the, the, the maintenance of secrecy on the part of the institution. And this, the secrecy part, well, it's partly to disguise their complete incompetence. I think you'll be pleased to know that they're nothing like as scary as they, they make themselves seem and they would be better advised to make everybody see how they are so that we wouldn't be so afraid of them. But never mind that. Uh, it is really important. And it is important to everybody in here who, who should find himself suddenly in, a, in an Ed Snowden kind of position. Uh, it's very important to open up those windows and let the light shine in there and, and make sure that secrecy doesn't go on in its, in its uninterrupted state. Uh, and if you, if you know something that you think that others have a right to know, and it often is the case that you, that you do. Uh, there's another organization that I founded with, with Glenn Greenwald and Daniel Ellsberg and, and Laura Poitras and John Cusack and Chenny Jardin very recently, to, first to fund WikiLeaks, but also we are taking care of people like Ed and anybody else that wants to come out of the woodwork. And so if you are one of those folks and you want to come out of the woodwork, we will, we will protect you and see that the things that you have to say get said in a way that they can't stop. And I, and I recommend you're checking out the Freedom of the Press uh, Foundation. We gave it a very innocuous name. Uh, because we're also, we're also building open source tools uh, for easy to use encryption for journalists and whistleblowers. And we could probably get a lot of your help on that. So check us out. There's a... So Barlow is a guy who has... Um built a community that's routed around a uh, corporate infrastructure with a firm hand. 
what kind of advice do you have for communities like this? You know, what kind of lessons learned from the stuff you've been able to build both in music and within this current space? What kind of suggestions do you have for this community to continue to grow itself and improve itself? Uh, resist ideology, uh, but, but encourage belief. And it's a fine line, but I mean, ideology is something that happens in your head and belief is something that happens in your heart. And, you know, try to make sure that you're operating from somewhere south of your head when you're, when you're imposing opinions on people. And try not to impose opinions on people when you can. Try to figure out ways to get the consensus to work so that so that you're, in, you're all in on this game together. And that's one of the beauty, beautiful things about an open source movement is you kind of have to be or the stuff doesn't work. Uh, I, I mean, I, really, I think my best advice would be that you go on doing what you appear to be doing. Uh, because I, I, I know there's politics in here. It's life among the humans. But it, it really doesn't seem very political by, by the standards that I've become accustomed to. I think, it's, I, I think you're doing the right stuff. Um, over here. Uh, you mentioned a minute ago about uh, building open source tools for helping journalists um, with encrypted communication. Mm -hmm. um, personally, to me, it seems like um, better access to easy encrypted communication for everybody is a very positive direction to go. Um, it seems like you agree with that sentiment. What technologies should, how can we do a better job of that? Is there somebody who's, who's advancing that that we should be, that you think that we should be paying attention to? And um, how can everybody in this room like help promote that? Well, you know, I, uh... I think the folks that, you know, that generally are in the, in the vicinity of Tor uh, and its many manifestations are really doing great work and, you know, and are farming it out and creating a community, you know, sort of the, of the larger Tor. Uh, that's, that's one area where I think is, uh, I see a lot of stuff that I have a confidence in. Do you see that as something that, sh that can and will move to be pervasive in all traffic that everybody I, I think, uses? I think it's, you know, it's in there practically everywhere now. You know, there's a, there are an awful lot of, of tour packets on the internet, lots of them. And, uh, you know, and I think that there are all kinds of things that we can do to just simply routinely make things invisible or semi-visible. I mean, you know, EFF has this HTTP, HTTPS everywhere program. You know, you just put a plug-in on your browser and all of your, your uh, communications are, are encrypted, <laughs> or at least they were until recently. <laughs> now I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, you're the people that will figure out how to solve that quickly, I hope. So. Oh. I agree with you when you say government surveillance is bad, and I also agree with you when you say that anybody should be able to find out anything they want about anything. In order to do that... No, I didn't quite say that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm synopsizing. <laughs> yeah, you're... You, it's, yeah. it's my filter okay. on what you said. So, so my grep may be flawed. Um, <laughs> But yeah, okay. nevertheless, both of them require the same thing, the acquisition, correlation, and dissemination of data. And mm -hmm. arguably, the differences are how the information is acquired, sometimes without consent or knowledge, and sometimes with, and the dissemination of the data is either controlled or free and open. My question is how do you reconcile the fact that they both have the same needs and requirements and ultimately goals other than evil versus good? Well, I don't know that they have the same goals. I mean, uh, I, I, sorry, anyone in 
the community that is being served. So anyone can find out anything if they're in the right community. Government surveillance is the government community and, and the security community, right. and the other side is everybody. Well, except that, you know, the, the reality is it doesn't fall out quite like that. I mean, the interesting thing is that, is that uh, I've been consulting to the NSA and the CIA for 20 some odd years. Uh, and, you know, I have my constituents in there who really believe that the, the objective of the whole enterprise is to figure out what the truth is and tell it as, uh, in, as, in as uninfluenced and unvarnished a way as possible to the people who make decisions. So that they actually make those decisions on the basis of, of knowledge rather than, than uh, hysteria. And both uh, sides believe themselves patriots. They, they, they do because they are. I agree. You know? Uh, I've been recently trying to get a conversation going between uh, a couple of uh, uh, friends of mine, uh, Mike Hayden and, and Ed Snowden. Uh, it, this has so far been steady work, but I, th <laughs> I, I think that, you know, I think that it's possible if I can, if I can com have a conversation with them and like them both so much, maybe I can bring them around to to sharing my opinion, but, uh, you know, it, it just, the thing that you gotta watch out for, it's not just data acquisition. Data, you know, actually the more data something evil has, the better off you are. Because, it, you know, if, if you're trying to find information, like in the needle in the haystack analogy, the first order of business is not to go out and exponentially increase the size of the haystack. <laughs> What you want to do is get a better magnet. And their magnets get worse. And, and we, we are spared their despotism by their incompetence. They, they don't know the difference between data and information. And there is a profound difference between data and information. Information is something that a human mind has found relevant. And making that transform is really important. And so really the, 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 the thing that you want to get down to is, is, all right, what do they find relevant? Why do they think this is important? What makes this information as opposed to something else? What do they intend to do with this information once they have it? What are they empowered to do? What are they visibly empowered to do and not so visibly empowered to do? Uh, those are the real questions. It's not whether or not they can get the information because at this point, anybody even half-wittedly on it can take the digital slime trail that you're laying down with every move you make and roll it back up and know you well. Uh, that's not the issue. It's, it's what you do with the stuff. Yes, uh, first, thank you for a terrifically interesting talk. And my question is, you cited the roles of religion and government as the institutions that are sort of putting, had put the brakes on the revolution of openness and collaboration, and they're coming back with a vengeance. But I was wondering what you felt was the role of the corporation, the multinational corporation in particular. As well, you said that you thought we don't have any real regulatory redress, only cultural redress. And I would think that we do still have regulatory redress in the sense that it's the role of the corporation and money in government that's preventing our democracy from being, you know, playing its regulatory role. Um, I think perhaps the nation states really have weaned their away from their power. They no longer have much power, but it's the money now and the corporations that are driving the government. And as of late, especially in the United States, for instance, you know, the Supreme Court is enabling corporations to completely co-opt our democracy. But have you totally given up the hope of, you know, regulatory political redress and reins on the corporations that way? And if so, how do we combat that problem? Well, you know, if I'd completely corporate? given up that hope, I wouldn't have so many of EFF's lawyers trudging off to, to do weary battle with those windmills every day. Uh, but the, you know, the, the the, the problem is that every time, you, every time you rest your faith in regulation, you, you extend its lifespan in a way. You, you, give it, you give it a credibility that it doesn't deserve. 
you know, so people were, people were talking about getting net neutrality from, from FCC rulings, and I grant that over a short period of time, if the, if the FCC had done what its similar bodies were doing in Europe at the same time in terms of recognizing the necessity for a proliferation of internet feeds, we would be in the same shape that the rest of the world, industrial world is in and having really great choices in internet service and, you know, uh, being much more advanced than we are in the United States where, where, you know, the Golemic Comcast is about to shut us down to something that will really be out of, you know, the Hobbit trilogy. But uh, anyway, it's, it, it's a bad situation we have here and we could have made it better at a certain critical point with with uh, regulations and, and obviously getting the, the public entities to, to rule on monopoly. You know, I mean, these guys, these guys claim that they're, inter they're interested in free markets. Well, you don't have a free market if you've got a, a market that is dominated by monopoly. That's not a free market. Uh, and, you know, you have to turn their rhetoric back around and say, well, all right, we're for a free market. Let's break up your goddamn monopolies. And then we'll have a free market. But you gotta have government with faith and power enough to do that. And uh, you know, the present sort of yellow-bellied government we got in Washington. Do you think that the internet community and that, you know, do you think the internet community and the Python or open source community has the power itself to bypass government's control over the corporations? I mean, if the corporations are themselves, you know, a source of rep repression and, you know, holding up this revolution that you seem to be advocating, yeah. how do we then, without the use of government or in conjunction with it, actually battle the corporations? You know, I think, and that, I think you, you have a key word there, bypass, you know, right. be sneaky. Uh, I mean, there, there was a point in my generation where people had, uh, had bumper stickers that said, resist authority. And, and I said, mine said, get around authority. You know, just be like good soldier Schweik, you know, smile, nod, and then go off and do what you're going to do anyway. <laughs> Thank you also for a great talk. I think that actually the Aquarian uh, Revolution is still coming, so I'm with you on that. And I hear... It's slow but steady. It's slow and steady, yeah, it's coming, <laughs> we're coming. <laughs> um, I actually hear a contradiction in what you're saying, and I'm hoping... It's probably talk a it paradox. Out. Yeah, maybe. So. I think that we need a very minimalistic government because there are literally crazy people who will kill us at a whim. And there are also external foreign governments that unfortunately still are run by dictators whose only goal in life is to take us over or whatever. So I think we need a minimal government. And the problem I see is that people are fighting, like the lady just before and you seem to approve of, more regulation, and I think we need less. And what we should advocate is a cleaner, as you say, more visible, very small government. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's a, there's, there were a number of, of uh, what you call prayer, contradictions <laughs> in what you just said, but, um, you, you know, I, I'm all, for, I'm all for some government. I mean, I'm really, I'm really all for government that does things like, you know, uh, make sure that, that kids don't starve in school. You know, I mean, it, I know that seems like, a, like awfully paternalistic, but <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm really all for government that, that makes it so that if, if you don't happen to have your medical card when you show up in an emergency room with two limbs off, that they don't wait around and try to find out whether or not they can admit you. Uh, you know, I, 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 there are just a lot of things that I think government ought to be there to do. I don't, I'm not, I'm not for getting rid of it entirely, but I'm, yeah. Okay. But I, but I am for localizing it uh, to the extent possible. 
uh, because I think that, that what, we, what information technology has done is to create this le level of government that is exactly the wrong level at about the nation state level where there's so much information that has to be processed at that level that the whole system just starts to fibrillate and doesn't work anymore. I mean, this, I, I expect to see the greatest renaissance of the city state since the renaissance because that's, that's the part of government that I think will work and, and, and will work interactively with cyberspace well. Is that a, is that a sign that says zero? Oh, so stop. <laughs> it's a very soft stop sign. <laughs> okay, well, that's a soft stop sign. So uh, I will be here uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, uh, thank you all very much for being here and, and being who you are. <laughs>